If I'm being like really honest, it feels literally like the first time I've had like my friends back since like year one of the band. Do you notice anything in your body as you say this? Like any yeah, sensation? Yeah, it gives me shivers. Like, and it, and it when I first got the call to work with Parkway Drive, I was a bit like, oh, I know the name, but who are they? I had to look them up. It was definitely not who I expected. It's not the music that I would listen to, seek out and listen to. Get your hands in the air, Rocky! Mine's not really relating to anyone else. It's more... You get a sense that for these guys, this is pretty new territory. Without even knowing it, I felt really disconnected from the band, unvalued. I guess, and uninspired. We're in a heavy metal band. We're not meant to be softies talking about our feelings and stuff. We're meant to be like these, oh, like, yeah, like, kill and this and that. But, yeah, so it's really foreign. Our way of communicating with our friends was teasing each other and, like, you just never gave anyone a compliment. Like Back in the early days, we were definitely best mates just having fun. But looking back, it was quite toxic. The way we would relate to each other is by pulling each other down, pointing out each other's shortcomings, and it would be like a war zone. My light bulb moment actually occurred when, you know, Luke kind of was the first person to go, you know what, I'm really sorry, guys. We're trying to resolve some pretty long-standing big issues uh, within the band. I was literally prepared to not be in the band anymore. Sounds like a lot of the other guys were as well. The counselling was the last hurrah. That was, can we save this? Like, is this savable? And I don't think anyone had any expectations. This whole process of trying to work it out started out as trying to save the band and has turned into trying to save our friendships. And the night grows dark. been going non-stop for almost 20 years now. Every album we have in Australia is a gold record. We have literally held, headlined the largest heavy metal festival on the planet in Vakken. It's like 80 to 100,000 people. Oh! Wow. wow, that was the biggest I've ever seen on night. We are Australia's largest heavy metal act. It's kind of surreal. We're up there with the top musical exports of this country, full stop. Pop, rock, R&B, whatever the hell's going on, we're up in that echelon. You'd think we'd be household names, wouldn't you? <laughs> we are filming with Fox League for NRL finals. So it's something completely different for us and it's pretty exciting. These are people that probably aren't Parkway fans, maybe never even heard of Parkway. One, two, three, four. A lot of Australians don't know who we are because of the genre of music. It's quite off-putting to a lot of people, and I get that. I don't know if most households want to be yelled at by this man. <laughs> There's definitely a stigma attached to heavy metal. But it's like, oh, yuck. Um, or, oh, that's the devil's music. For me, the attraction to it, it's the energy. I'm not an aggressive or assertive person in my everyday life, but there's something in me that needs to be released. There's only two ways I can seem to get that out, and that's through playing heavy metal live and, you know, surfing seems to help with that too. We all grew up in Byron Bay, and it's not where you'd expect a heavy metal band to come from. Personally, I'm into surfing, nature, meditation, spirituality, healthy food. I've never drunk alcohol, I'm vegan. Uh, and I happen to be in a heavy metal band. <laughs> if 
we all knew each other from either high school or the surf. We started in the garage 20 years later. We're still in the garage. Okay. We <laughs> definitely don't fit the picture of a typical metal band. Definitely not at all. Not an opportunity. You know, you have to wear all black or giant boots and you have to have long hair. We just weren't interested. The Parkway Drive legend is five surfer bums starting a band on a street called Parkway Drive in the drummer's parents' basement. Everything they say would seem fair inside of me. Back in those days, it just sounded like a hell of a lot of noise. As time went by, I began to soundproof various parts of the house, <laughs> eventually with soundproof doors, ceilings, over the windows. The cows seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> Our first show was March 21st, 2003, at the Byron Youth Centre. There's fists flying and kids jumping off the speakers and it was just complete chaos. I don't know how an adult didn't shut that down. From there, within the space of a year, it just blew up. The way we made our mark was relentless touring. Dad is a doorknob. It was just all about having fun for us. There was no seriousness or pressure whatsoever because there was no goal or expectations to get anywhere. All of a sudden, a thousand people at a show, and we're like, holy shit, what is this? And that sort of paved the way for everything that came after. The first time we went to Europe was just a complete new adventure. We played some horrible shows. There was literally 10 people there. It sucked. But then you'd play another show and there'd be a bit of momentum. We hadn't been in Europe long when our bass player informed us that he actually had to fly home. He was going to become a dad. We were like, who do we get? Another bass player that knows his instrument and is a musician and really good. And we just thought, nah, fuck it. Let's get a mate that, that we love hanging out with because he'd sold merch for us on tours previously. <laughs> So I was like a full-blown fan of the band, like, but I was their good friends as well. <laughs> we just called him up and said, do you want to come play bass? I said, me? I've never, I've never played bass in my life. And they were like, yeah, you don't have to be good. Oh, my God. Oh, God. <laughs> is that where my first show is? This is a show. And sure enough, I was atrocious. <laughs> Not cool at all. I was dropping my pick and somehow they stuck with me. Uh, I'm going to turn a little bit more. Uh, yeah. I felt like an imposter. Oh, yeah. When fans and stuff get my signature, I'm just like, you don't want my signature. I'm just like you. I just woke up this morning and did a poo and had breakfast. Like, I'm just the same as you. Where are we? Czech Republic. We slept in cow paddy. <laughs> and I got attacked by ants. I think we did a five-month tour of the world, that first tour that I did. And in five months, we slept in two hotels the entire time. Have a look at our sleep last night. And things fell into place. The more people we played in front of, the more we kind of grew. For me, the heavy metal is incredibly physically cathartic. It's the place to let out all of these repressed feelings. Yeah. 
what do you think those people are doing when they're in the mosh pit just losing their mind and throwing their limbs around and jumping on each other? They're not trying to hurt anyone. They're just, like, it lets it out. And then you walk out of that venue better than when you walked in. Probably about five years in, when the band actually started to make money, I started noticing that the salaries weren't the same. I had a talk to him once he found out we got paid more than him after a tour, and it, it like, shocked him. And I was like, yeah, this is, you know, we do all this work, you're just playing bass, that's how it is. The way it was explained to me was that I'm a contractor, basically just a hired musician. I played live and that was, that was it. So I always viewed my role in the band as just being the bottom of the pecking order, the shit kicker. But it's hard, like when you're, when you're watching your friends buy their, you know, oh, I don't want to talk about that, but when you're watching your friends earning all this money and you're earning far less money, it starts playing on your mind and you start having resentment. It's a tired old story, how money breaks up friendships and bands and stuff. Fast forward to where we've got a whole bunch of successful albums and the band's grown significantly. You know, we weren't really ready um, for the extra workload that that would, that that would bring as well. We didn't outsource anything. If there was a job to be done, we learned how to do that job. Like, someone in the band took on that role. We are here in Berlin for day one of rehearsals. Like, you need a manager, Luke learns how to manage. We want to make a movie, Ben learns how to edit movies, you need a producer. Jeff learns how to do production, you need someone to do interview and, like, stagecraft. I'll learn how to do that one. What that meant for us is we started drifting further into our own little worlds. I'm fried. Luke, being the manager, has done an incredible job in many, many aspects, but in a band, you go to the manager for emotional support and for help. My co-manager has to do everything. But any time I had to talk to Luke about managerial issues, I didn't feel like I was respected as a band member. It just looks untidy and fucked. I've been asking for two days to see it fixed, though, and I haven't seen it. Just the way, you know, Luke acted on tour, the way Luke made us feel as people. I had a lot of trust issues, like, with Luke anyway, because he's, you know, he's running all the band, he's running all our finances. We're making nothing, like, straight up, pouring every cent the shows make back into putting the show on. I just, yeah, wasn't very tolerant of people. That's kind of our strategy, I guess. So if anyone did something that annoyed me, I'd hold it against them and then it'd build up. Like, I would come home and not want to see the guys. We're the biggest we've ever been by far and we're potentially losing money on the tour, not making money. Yeah. And you've just got to say... When we got to a point where we were actually starting to make pretty serious money, it did seem to affect certain members. Tell everyone, yeah. so everyone knows. And they seem to think that they deserve to be paid more than others. That's all I expected, to be honest. Well, like, why is no one in the band getting that there's more work involved in what we're doing in this band now that it's blown up and, like, Luke's working, like, 14-hour days every single day? Molotov, take one. And I'm flying around the world to do a press tour when everyone else is staying at home. But I think there needs to be more time of it. There's no lull for certain members of the band. So when we started the band, the core members basically had a handshake deal to share everything equally because everything wasn't much. And it just stayed the same until 15 years later when we said, you know, let's review this. But yeah, it, it opened a big can of worms. 
I wrote this riff, but you wrote those lyrics, but you were there supporting, but Luke's managing, I'm making the movies, Jeff's writing most of these riffs. It's like, it's so hard to actually come to terms with who's worth what in what situation, and that was a big part of why it kind of fell apart. I think Ben was affected the most out of those discussions and the rearrangement. And, yeah, he obviously wasn't happy about it, but he accepted it. I earn a lot of respect for Ben, for him to be able to, to, to take what he took and move on. COVID hits and, unknowingly, the band's at a complete boiling point. We're not playing live shows, so let's write a record. Writing a record, when someone says that, it puts a shutter down my spine um, because I'm the one doing it, producing it and engineering it. Every single time I do one, a portion of my soul goes with me. As the deadline for the recording of the album gets closer, he changes. He becomes stressed. <laughs> he doesn't have the ability to be family guy and then work guy because his studio is here, but his family's also here. Having him disappear is really frustrating. And he will just keep going until all hours of the morning, no matter how early he's got to get up, to just get something right. I do see the other guys kind of just, you know, fly in and fly out. And for me, that's hard to watch. Kill! 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 So things definitely came to a head recording our new album, Darker Still. Jeff especially became very consumed with, like, the idea of, of perfection. Well, Winston and Jeff seem to really get to a bad place this record. Keep digging, the whole thing runs on blood. Jeff's kind of the main riff writer. I mean, him write a lot of the songs, but he's the main guy, I would call him. That last bit was cool. Yeah, yeah. No, no. The first bit might be a bit busy. Double the length of the verse and then go into the main. Right, uh, don't forget the full picture. Winston writes all his own lyrics and vocals, but a lot of the time Jeff changes all them and Winston can get upset with I that. I think what you did then was so sick, but I, I, I really do think it needs to be condensed. The, uh, I really do. I was a, a creative bully. Yeah. I've come down here, cut all his vocals in half, you know, rearrange stuff. You know, which for me, it sounds good, but it's not his story. It's not his original intent. I just couldn't get that out of my head, that melody over everything else, you know, the way things sound is far more important for this band than, you know, his message. Um, The lack of understanding of what I actually do and my and what goes into what I do was evident there, and it, like it, it hit me. Oh, they didn't get what I was doing for 20 years. Like actually, they didn't even understand the thing that I'm passionate about. <laughs> like it's nuts. On the day we finished the record, Winston and I couldn't even look at each other. You know, if I was stuck on a desert island, I'd be with any person except him on Earth. Like, I really, I was really annoyed by him. I had a couple of talks with, with Winston, and he, he just mentioned that the other guys were questioning my management. They were assuming I'm dropping the ball in certain areas. I'd pretty much prepared myself to not be in the band anymore. I'd figured out all my finances and I wanted to make sure I could keep my house um, if I wasn't in Parkway anymore. The crisis point basically came after all of this was going on. We just agreed to have a band meeting, 
like to talk about where we're at, plans for the future, how everyone's feeling. So driving to the hall in Lennox Head, it was early afternoon. I had a lot to say and a lot to vent. The fights, the falls, the scars and broken bones beneath it all. The cracks begin to show the hurt. The we walk into the meeting not as loaded guns, but as nuclear warheads. Everyone's in intention was to hold everyone else responsible for how they felt at that point. Someone's like, oh, I need validation for this. You need to tell me this. Me. And they're like, well, if I need to know that, you need to tell me this. You see all of a sudden, it's just like, boom, this fissure runs straight down. He realised that there's like years of resentment here. And I was like, we have to see a counsellor before we do anything. We need to be able to talk to each other before we can even think about negotiating. When the phone call came that we're cancelling our American tour, I kind of expected it, but it was also a surprise. I'm so far removed from the whole business side of the band that I was semi-oblivious to all this stuff. Luke said, hey, everyone's at each other's throats, so we're making a decision to do counselling. And so I just said, yeah, OK, I hope you guys work it out. I was actually starting to question touring in the pandemic, I actually got a job to try and see what a hard day's work is like. So I worked for two months doing like proper hard labor. And I loved it. You know, I was getting praise from the boss telling me how good I was at it and making honest money. And I, and I was thinking, this feeling that I'm getting is how you should feel about your job. And so I kind of was stoked when the tour was cancelled. I think it's a very unique experience for five guys to be, you know, meeting in late teens and forming this experience and it turning into an international business, basically. Joe, how are you? Nice to see you, mate. Good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, and in the first session, it was really clear really quickly that between uh, Luke and Ben and Jeff and Winston that there'd been stuff that had gone down. I thought we'd do a theme check-in this time, which is, of course, talking about how you're arriving. Basically, Sean is telling us to remove our armour and, you know, that's all we've ever known. What you first came with? I think everyone kind of felt safe with him. I didn't know how to speak to anyone, you know. All I knew was... A pivotal point for me, which was really important, was to see essentially the biggest bully in the room, which is Luke, be vulnerable. And, you know, to, like, acknowledge why he acted in the way he did. When I look back at how I behaved within the band and outside the band. I'm pretty disappointed in myself, for sure. Particularly with you, I, Luke, I feel like you've come the furthest. Like, from... I've always been touted as an asshole, basically. All through high school, I was a bit of a prick to, to girls and, and other people. We obviously had our tensions coming in here, but... And I just feel like you've really done the work on yourself and you've really, like, grown a lot. And I, I feel totally different around you now. Like... He was one of the most boarded up, pious walls out of anyone in the group, and he just brought it all down. I was just really proud of him. It made me go, right, this is it. This is a, a really important moment in Parkway Drive's future. This is, this is huge and I want to be on board. To me, the communication is the key. 
and if, if, I, if I can put the effort in communicating with you guys. We're definitely peeling back all the layers. We're, we're talking about those early days, how we even got to acting like that from our own childhoods and upbringings and it's very, it's getting very personal in there. The culture that we grew up in, in Byron and in Australia at large really, was the culture of writing off or teasing <laughs> your mates. It would be like a war zone, like you had to be on guard, someone would be attacking you and you'd have to be ready to respond. Once I got into it, I got good at it. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but yeah, you know, I, I figured the game out, you know, attack everyone else until no one's going to attack you again. I think the concept of toxic masculinity 100% relates to us. I think it relates to the era that we were brought up. I think it relates to the way that we chose to treat each other and having Things happen in the band over the years where we're like, that ain't right, man. Like, like you're just bullying him. And other people go, nah, it's just funny. And you're going, nah, that's not, that's not right. You never know just what you've got till it's slipping through your fingers. It was pretty evident that everyone wanted to feel like they're in a band again, like in a band of mates. And it, it wasn't about trying to get the biggest slice of the pie. There's no one left beside you. There was a point where it was like, Joe, he needs to come to the next meeting. After, I think, the third or fourth counselling session, they said, oh, we really want you to come. And I said, oh, well, I don't think I've got anything to say. Like, are you sure you want me there? And they said, yeah, it'd be, it'd, we all want you there. You never know just what will break you. I was completely blindsided because I went in expecting not to talk. And all of a sudden, they all said something really nice about me and what they appreciate about me. And it was so hard, so hard. Like, I'm about to cry talking about it now because it's just so foreign to hear your friends say nice things about you. Then they asked me how I was feeling and how was I feeling. I basically just exploded and just broke down and, yeah, I had, like, a really hard few years and a um, very tra traumatic thing happened um, where in 2016 my partner, Tegan, was diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer. It was really really difficult, the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. Is it a I'll try to <laughs> love her. <laughs> the entire band's existence had led up to this one tour that was coming up. And then the day that I was leaving to the airport, I dropped her at a friend's house and she said, through, through her tears, she said, I don't, don't want you to go, stay. And I, I thought what that would mean to the band. I put the band before her and I said, like, I have to go. I can't cancel on the boys this last minute, like... Um, and so I went, and that was the last time I ever saw her. And I live with that guilt every day now. That's a bigger sacrifice than any of us have made. Sorry. Just looking around and seeing them crying with me kind of made me realise, you know, these guys do care. Just what he must have gone through. And the fact that he did it for our band, you know. 
And then at that time, we're not even... No, we're still thinking he's just a feeling bass player. <laughs> I feel guilt. In the dark car park out the back as we all made our way to our cars, they said, hang on, we've got something else we want to talk to you about before you go. We've all decided we want you in the partnership. We want you to actually be in the band. And we all shook hands and they said, welcome to the band. 17 years later, <laughs> like you're finally in the band. Jai is now a partner and a director of the company. And now he, he earns a percentage of whatever the band earns. So we're all making a sacrifice financially to include him. But we think it's the right thing to do and it should have been done earlier. For me personally, I know not everyone's the same, but I don't want all this new sensitive men thing to interrupt the good um, revving each other up yeah, and having a joke. I love it a lot, like I love getting called the dog rooter and this and that. <laughs> like, I actually legit love that and I don't want that to stop. Yeah, me too, I like it too. But, and it, 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 it all comes down to, like, the intention. I feel like there's just a happy meeting with all this stuff. Like, if we were like this all the time, I'd leave the band. <laughs> yeah, I right. would, seriously, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> we have all grown and we'll all grow from this. Might lose some friends, because they'll see me crying on TV, but that's fine. <laughs> That's easy to Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Parkway Drive is being fixed. I don't think it's been fixed. <laughs> but we are in a much better place than we were a few years ago, or even a few months ago, to be honest. Wow, so I guess, you know, the lesson is therapy works. Yeah, and, man. Uh, and it's helpful. Yeah, for real, like, for real. You're about to head off to Europe <laughs> for a uh, yeah. couple of weeks of touring. First tour uh, back, man. We're yeah. all really psyched for it. I'm in a familiar place doing a familiar thing and feeling very unfamiliar. Like, it's the first time we're playing to our fans in Europe in three years. It's the first time playing as a unit since we've done all this personal work together and we felt this connection grow even stronger. Put us back into our comfort zones where, you know, everyone's laughing and the egos are flying. Um, you know, can we hold true? to these new skills learn? Let's find out. Time will tell.